Welcome. We're here on the last day of our Pfizer Institute. Uh, the energy has been really amazing throughout the week, and um, I know people got especially energized yesterday by the youth panel, uh, but I've really enjoyed uh, meeting a lot of you, and I think there's been some great networking happening. And um, thank you for coming out for this last day. Um, I think we have some people who are off sightseeing, perhaps, <laughs> the, the non-California folks. But um, we have two amazing keynotes this morning. Uh, our theme for the day is fundraising and sustainability in community-based participatory research. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce both of the keynote speakers uh, right now. And then following the keynote speakers, we'll um, have a little group discussion about learnings from the Institute. And we also have an evaluation that we're asking you to complete um, while we have you here as a captive audience. We'll also be sending a uh, more um, a comprehensive evaluation uh, via an online survey program next week, but um, you know we wanted to to make sure that we have those of you who are here complete this evaluation that we have um, today. Uh, so I would like to introduce um, Dr. Norval Hickman, who is a program officer for the Social and Behavioral Sciences for the California Tobacco Related Disease Research Program. Um, which is part of the University of California, uh, uh, based over in Oakland. He oversees research grants focused on the use and prevention of tobacco, nicotine, and nicotine products among California's disproportionately impacted groups. His work also focuses on the elimination of tobacco-related health disparities and uh, TRDRP's grant mechanism for school and community-engaged and community-based participatory research. Um, much of his work has focused on clinical trials and public health research for tobacco use surveillance, prevention, and cessation. Uh, he has his doctoral degree from the University of California, San Diego, and San Diego State University joint doctoral program in clinical psychology and completed postdoctoral training at the University of California in San Francisco. Sonida Fernandez is a program officer for the Community Initiatives and Public Health Sciences at the California Breast Cancer Research Program, which is also part of the University of California Office of the President. Uh, she's a clinical psychologist with a specialization in behavioral medicine and uh, graduated from the same program as Norval. I believe you knew each other in that program, correct? Um, so uh, prior to working at CBCRP, she was an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of General Internal Medicine at New York University School of Medicine, uh, where she did mixed methods research uh, around health disparities. Um, she completed her postdoctoral training at Columbia University, and I've had the good fortune of working with Sinaida on a project training community academic teams in CBPR uh, and breast cancer research. So she oversees all of that work for California Breast Cancer Research Program, and it's been a great joy to work with Sinaida on that project. So, um, Norval, uh, please join us. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, Juliana. And I, is it, is it, can everyone hear me? I, I talk kind of loud. Do you want mic? Okay, I'll give you my thing. Um, and what I'm going to do is, would you mind advancing? Still? All right, thank you. I'm going to do a little bit of a different motion. I, I went to a talk at a community health event, and there is a person there who was advancing their slides using their iPad, but, you know, I don't have that technology right now, so we're doing more of the grassroots approach, and Juliana's going to help me. So thank you for playing along with this. We'll see how it works. If it gets too cumbersome, I'll, I'll man the slides there. Um, so to get into a little bit about what we do, um, we're a mouthful organization, tobacco-related disease research program, so we go by TRDRP. Uh, still hard to say five times fast, but um, that's who we are based on Proposition 99 and what, how we got labeled. So advancing just who we are, we're a state-funded, uh, focused uh, tobacco research program as I said, uh, created as a result of Proposition 99 and that the voters passed in 88. And what that did is it put a quarter um, per pack uh, cigarette surtax um, on, on all cigarettes. And it did put a tax on other uh, cigars, other tobacco products, but the main one was the, the quarter per pack. And out of the dollars collected, TRDRP gets five cents of each of, the, of those, that surtax that's collected. So, that um, actually uh, builds up over time since we're a big state and we have a lot of smokers uh, and people uh, with nicotine addiction smoke a lot. So 
Uh, but we have no more than 5% of those dollars can go to administrative costs, so we have to keep it uh, pretty low. 95% is going into the community at some level. Thank you. So what we, we fund uh, in California is academic institutions, or researchers, community researchers, and people doing school-based research. And the research must benefit Californians. Um, some projects do have a focus out of state or might do another, a, a part of it out of state, but the primary emphasis has to be on uh, California communities. And we are administered by the um, University of California, that's by the proposition language, but we fund studies outside of the UC system, so, and out, outside of the CSU, California State University system. Uh, we fund research in uh, community college level, uh, different community organizations, uh, school districts uh, that are partnered with academics or even independent evaluation uh, consulting firms sometimes are involved in our funded projects. And this just gives a little, uh, it's kind of hard to see probably from the back, but this just gives you a sense of our, how much money we've had over time since 99. As you can see, when we had a lot of smokers, we were around the 40 million mark there, all the way to the left. And then in the early 90s, early to mid 90s, there was a dip, and that's when Pete Wilson decided to take our money away. And then they had to go through the courts, and then the money, the state slowly gave us the money back, and that's where you see that increase again. But then, after, in the 2000s, the tobacco prevalence in the state decreased. Uh, which is a good thing. That means we're being effective in not only the research, but the program planning that's taken place. What's gone on on the ground, the boots on the ground have actually done a lot of phenomenal work in getting smoke-free policies and uh, denormalizing tobacco use throughout the state. That's why we don't have a lot of you know, people smoking in this room right now, which is a good thing. Um, but because there has not been another infusion of cash since this 1988 proposition, the, you know, through inflation, are, it's eroded our ability to fund research. And as you can see, and it's an item I highlight with the breast cancer program, is there's been a slow decline in funds and uh, about three to five percent each year, but right now, as of 2012-13, uh, we are about a little over 11, about 11 million, a little over 10 million. And as I said, only five percent of those dollars can go to administrative costs. So that means we're funding about 10 million uh, in terms of research. And what research do we fund? Uh, we, our goal is to uh, fund studies that enhance our understanding of the prevalence of tobacco use, uh, prevention and cessation strategies, the social, psychological, cultural, biological, genetic, economic, and policy-related aspects of tobacco use and tobacco-related diseases in, Cal in California communities. That's a mouthful and a lot uh, in terms of breadth of work that we do. We fund work that is, that is at the social community level, but we also fund work that is at the, the, the basic science level. And all those laboratory studies are very expensive, especially at private institutions. Uh, we do fund research at private institute, academic institutions as well because of uh, overhead costs and things that maybe have come up in this discussion. But uh, when you look at that money as in terms of 10 million, it might feel like quite a bit, but then after you divvy it up between the different disciplines and the the, the number of grants you get and the review process, it actually isn't that much. And the program, I'm sorry, this one has that annoying, yeah, I just put the whole thing up there. I copied this from another talk, so you, you kind of added some animation, I don't like that, but. The advantage, in terms of uh, the program, we see the advantages, and I'm going through participatory research in terms of our lens because you have to keep in mind each funding agency has a slightly different way that they interpret CDPR or community engaged or community participatory research, right? So I would say in terms of TRDRP and our history, you know, we've seen participatory research as really improving the quality and validity of research by engaging local knowledge, acknowledging that knowledge is power uh, for communities and can influence policy that can lessen health disparities. It lays the basis to break down a history of distrust in many communities uh, on research that's been long-standing and, and rightfully so. And that just is really hitting on a few of the principles. I'm kind of getting the overarching ones that really kind of resonate with the program, the types of grants we fund. Um, thank you. The print in terms, yeah, okay, we're on the next one. Uh, in terms of the principles of participatory research, uh, you know, the, the nine, the, the, what I'd say is uh, something like the, the nine major principles you see in uh, the, the, the uh, Meredith Nagler and, um, uh, help me out, Israel, Barbara Israel put forth, those are the ones that 
we, we want the spirit to come through in the applications, but I want to highlight some that really kind of, I feel, resonate with uh, strong grant applications that come into our office. And that is um, integrating knowledge and action for mutual benefit, uh, just, uh, plans to disseminate findings on multiple levels in creative ways, too. Um, and really, you see that there is a commitment to a long-term relationship between the research partners. Uh, sometimes we have multiple community groups working with uh, a couple of academics at different institutions, and you know it takes a lot to for forge that type of relationship. And you, you want to see that that's going to be standing outside the life of the grant. But that's not just limited to the work that's proposed in the project. But there are plans to to continue that work and that effort and to maintain that relationship after the grant. You're really setting the foundation for a long, long the long haul here. Um, and then this is a quote, I believe, from uh, some, one, some of the RCBPR gurus. Um, really, we see participatory research as empowering both community members and researchers to be active participants in understanding and transforming mutually agreed upon issues confronting the community of interest. Next slide, please. Oh, there we got another one of those. And uh, other advantages is, I think, we really see it has the potential to overcome fragmentation and isolation of the individual from research. You know, you're working as a team um, and, and you're seeing the benefit beyond just uh, an investigator or one community organization or lead person at the community level. And, and also we, we consider it a, you're bringing money into the, into the community. You're, you're, you're building infrastructure and capacity, but you're also providing an economic uh, incentive and benefit and showing that the work that is done related to research is important, deserves to be um, reimbursed and, and paid for. So you, it does allow for employment, training, it, cro it crosses over into other work that people are doing in the communities. And it is, it's good humility on the part of academics. Some people who are senior investigators come in and they know a lot about what's going on in the field. They go in a community and, and their ideas get shifted, changed, or maybe thrown out. And being willing to still work with that group and say, hey, we have a common interest in mind. And we're going we're gonna, to, even if we don't agree initially, we're going to come to a point where we agree on, on how to approach this issue and, and get a strong research application in. So the, the empowerment and knowledge against marginalization and, um, and for marginalized groups is, is, is very important. And I would say as a program, we, you know, we pay attention to that. And in technical assistance, I'm, I'm aware of that. If it sounds too academic and clean, sometimes that makes me nervous. Because I know how reviewers who do community-based research and, and judge community-based research proposals, how they're going to look at that when we get into the study section. All right, now I'm going to move into a little bit about our actual grant mechanisms. And the, again, a small slide, but as you can see, we have a lot of different mechanisms. And we have mechanisms that are that's at the top. That's our big money uh, mechanism. It's called the Full Research Training Project Mechanism. Um, these are fully developed, really scientifically rigorous projects, um, three years in length and up to 375000 for direct costs. So indirect costs would get added on top of that, and sometimes with different community groups, they will have a, like what they call a subcontract and possibly a separate budget that can also um, sometimes that can if that can exceed that 375 because of that too. Those costs to to cover everyone's um, uh, expenses. And then as you move down the list, you get into the exploratory. That's where the pilot projects. Trying to need the data to see if your ideas are holding some fruition there. Uh, we, I'll, get more, I'll get more detail about our participatory research mechanisms, but we do have two, one community-based, one school-based, and uh, we have one at the pilot early stage level and, and also at the full level. Um, we have postdoctoral awards, dissertation awards, uh, special projects, which are like little dissemination grants uh, for conference support, usually from people that are funded by us, but not always. Uh, who want to uh, do some tobacco work at a conference or present on something. And then we have a Cornelius Hopper Diversity Supplement, and that's for people who have an award and want to bring on um, a trainee from an underrepresented group or, that, uh, or a trainee that's going to work on a uh, tobacco-related issue impacting a disproportionately impacted group in the state. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the dollar amounts and all of that that's on our website, but this is just to give you a sense of the breadth of work that we fund. Okay. Perfect. Um, in terms of 
the two CDPR focused mechanisms, they're called the CARA and SARAs. CARAs are Community Academic Research Awards and then the School Academic Research Awards or the SARAs. Really, it's supposed to stimulate and support collaborations between community-based organizations or schools and or schools with academic investigators. The awards are to support a collaborative partnership to perform scientific research into tobacco control issues that are identified as important and meaningful to specific communities or schools in California. And we recognize that, you know, when you go into a community and you're, you're talking about tobacco issues, there might be other issues that are, are highly important to the community. So some projects also will include um, uh, another health-related issue. If a community is really um, you know, concerned about, and this has happened before, maybe poverty-related issues, they've done tobacco cessation work or tobacco education, and maybe jobs training, or some groups are really saying, you know, in this young adult group or a particular group, alcohol is an issue or substance use, and they'll have a project that's tobacco and focus on that other issue. So we do consider applications like that. Again, it's, there's a, a grantsmanship aspect to, to really strongly sell that you can address both issues in a, um, in a, in a meaningful way, but you know, also address the tobacco disparity and the disparity in, in another area. Uh, and, and that's why it's good to have that, that, those good collaborators that can say, hey, wait a minute, you know, are we too diffuse here? We're focused. And, and, they're, they're, and, and as a program officer, we provide, I provide technical assistance on that too. Okay. Next slide. I hope this one comes. Okay. So this gets a little more detail about the pilot. This is the Cara Sarah, the uh, exploratory developmental stage. So these are two year studies, um, about 100, um, it's 200,000 uh, in total, and usually broken down 100,000 per year. Uh, if it's a school based one, the California Department of Education will provide an additional $15,000 supplement to cover school related costs. This is an agreement that we have with them, and we're trying to streamline the process to get that funding out the door because it does take some time working with two agencies. Uh, it's intended to support uh, this mechanism, initial phase of the project, innovative projects. You know, proof of concept, uh, something developmental, something that you're like, I think something's there, I, have a, I can build an argument for it, but we need the data to kind of to support that notion. That's what this is for. You know, to give you that good data that you can apply for us for a bigger award or another agency to help you leverage funds. Uh, to, so, but it, it, you know, we realize that you need a little bit of seed money to get that data. And, it, we, and, and this mechanism also addresses uh, relevant organizational and research feasibility issues. It can, doesn't have to. Uh, identify, identification, establishment, and strengthening of the collaborative roles. So we want people to talk about, yeah, we're gonna get an advisory board together to help us out, we're going to form this relationship. Uh, people come in at varying stages of the, of the relationship with different organizations, so they may want to strengthen a uh, connection they already have, or they might want to build something new. So that can be described in the proposal, and we encourage that. It could be an aim, actually, to build that kind of, uh, of uh, collaborative partnership. Um, but the study design methodology still has to be has to be solid, too. So that's why the academic first. And then some community researchers are really good at the, the practical nature of getting um, the work done. So I want to discount that also, all the contributors there. And then moving on to our full award, this is the big, our biggest uh, money award, uh, $375,000 over three years, uh, usually broken up on average $175,000. Again, we're talking direct costs, not indirect costs, so indirect would be added on top of that. And from the CDE for a full award, if you're doing school-based research, this is if you're doing, you have to be in the school or relate, doing research affecting school-aged youth, you could get an additional $50,000 um, from uh, the Department of Education to support that project. And these projects, proposals, need to be fully developed. They need to be scientifically rigorous. Um, they, they must include sound, background information, hypotheses. And, I mean, the hypotheses can be uh, tied to specific aims. It doesn't always have to be a traditional, like, clinical trial type hypotheses. But, um, they, they, you have to have some really, you know, good ideas that uh, what you're studying is going to produce some kind of benefit or impact or effect. Um, it's not, 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 this isn't the fishing expedition type of mechanism. And um, you must demonstrate the collaboration between the community, school, and academic partners. It has to be a strong collaboration at this point. You guys have been working together a while. 
uh, on different things, even if it's not this is the project and the proposal, but there's that that connection there, that, that link between all the players that are going to be involved in doing the work. Okay? So this is to show how our CBPR mechanisms, our Harris and Saris, have done over the years. Again, small slide, but starting in 99, we were fun 99 and 2000, 2000, 2000 we, we got about 13 to 14 grants in. Um, in those, both years, funded five in each year. And that's, we, we consider that a funding rate of 38% for this mechanism. And then, um, not so great in 01, 02, 03, we got more grants in. You know, again, still uh, about five or three getting funded. Then in the 2000s, we kind of dipped, where we're only getting seven, six or so uh, proposals in the door, and uh, one or two would get funded. Uh, so in 2011, that's where that arrow is, we did a training for the 2012 mechanism, and the training involved uh, people preparing a proposal, some of the work people in Europe done, getting feedback, and actually, you know, able to talk to the reviewers and, 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 and interact with them, uh, and then work on their proposal and submit something. And when we did that, we got 15 proposals, back to our earlier numbers, uh, for uh, funded, uh, getting our funding rate back up to 27%. Last year, um, I didn't get the chance to get, get that training together, and, and we had some challenges getting partners uh, involved, because we want both the community and academic side there at these trainings. Uh, so we, we, last year we got nine, and that's what we're funding this year. We're funding two, so 22%. So you see that drop off. So the, I want this is to show these trainings, things that you're doing, really can make a difference. And we're looking at it at, from the, the funder's perspective, on the individual level, you don't think it helps if you didn't get funded necessarily, but it gets you thinking early about the projects, working early with the teams that you're going to work with, and, and, and then it, it makes for a better proposal and better, stronger ideas. It really does. And it shows in the, in the grant proposals. So we're going to hold another one of these. I'll give more information, but it won't be until next February. Uh, but we, we are going to hold another one of those trainings. We, we see it as beneficial on the, as, from the funder side. Okay, so I'm going to go through a few participatory research musts. Um, I mean, and this, these are my opinions. Uh, so, you know, um, different people will tell you different things, but just you know, uh, being a TRDRP and seeing the types of uh, CDPR projects coming in, I really think the best thing I can say is start early in terms of identifying the partners you might want to work with, exploring the research questions. You need to start early. If there's a training I'm doing in February, we need to start talking next in July or August about who you might work with. I mean, it's that kind of thing. You know, so you can meet and, and discuss and see if that's a good uh, relationship, a good connection. You know, it might not. You know, um, certain groups see that they might not work well with others. And you want to have that time to say, I want to talk to somebody else. I don't know about this one group, but this other group you know, might, might work a little better. Or who else might work better? And we can help with that, but we need time to do it. Clarifying the expectations up front, major, major, for all the people involved, what are you doing for the community, what do you hope to get out of this, this work, not just this grant, but the work you're going to do together outside the life of the grant. Um, alternate your meetings between the academic setting and the community, you know, simple things like that. And even saying that in the grant proposal is very helpful, you know, that you, that it's not just going to be on one side, where the community is going into the university, to, you know, because the, the meeting space is bigger, uh-uh. That, it, you know, it needs to be collaborative where the effort and the transportation costs and demands are, are shared at some level. It doesn't have to be 50-50, but at least shared. Um, high level of contact and ongoing communication. Very key. You know, not just meeting with your advisory board quarterly or, you know, uh, yeah, twice a year. No, we're, and, and with the advisory board, there might be you know, times where you meet more frequently and you space it out. But at least the key players involved in the project are communicating uh, frequently, or have a plan to keep that going, are committed to doing it, having those meetings, you know, moving things forward. It really helps. Even getting the proposal done, it helps we, to, to be as structured as you can. Uh, and then set aside time for all parts of intervention. So, when you're writing a proposal and you say you want to do all these things, really make sure it's feasible. It sounds like you can do everything you're going to do. You're going to recruit X number of people in X amount of time. You're going to do focus groups. You're going to do. Don't try to cram too much in. That actually ends up hurting you. So people think the more the better. Sometimes less is more. And I see that a very nice, clean, well-argued proposal 
goes much better uh, through a review process. Keep in mind, a lot of these reviewers are reviewing your proposals like at 2 a.m. the night before they're going to come to a study section. And they're weary eyes. They, they don't want to see too much. They want it to be clear. They want it to make sense, seem like it has potential impact to benefit public health. That's what they want. They want it to just rise off the paper when they're reading it. Okay, roles and responsibilities uh, for each partner must be clearly described and delineated as much as you can. Uh, applicant partners must de demonstrate a plan to use methods that are relevant, culturally sensitive, appropriate for, and accepted by the participating community members or school settings or school members. Um, efforts to mitigate power differences in the decision making and control at all stages of the project must be clearly articulated. And I have all of this in the call for applications we put out. So when people look at this and are writing their proposals, th these are the, I, I got the, the major points from that call. And we, each year we tweak it, so this fall I'll, I'll write and revise it some, but it won't change majorly um, for our next cycle, but in um, the 2014 to 2015 it, it might. Um, so these are the expectations I have as a funder that I want the proposals to, to really get home on and really address. Um, again, the community and academic partnership plan for the long-term working relationship. The focus on the grant proposal may shift depending on the needs of the community group, and both sides should be ready for that. However, there must be an emphasis, as I said, on tobacco-related issues. That's Prop 99 dollars. We're getting money from cigarette taxes, so it has to address tobacco at some level. Um, the proposals can have a secondary focus, like I said, on, on other health, social justice, economic, or policy-related issues, and that's fine. And it'll actually, some, in some cases, strengthen the proposal if it really relates well. Uh, the grant proposal, next slide. Thank you. The grant proposal should clearly show that all partners are involved at each stage of the project, identifying the problem, formulating the question, designing the invention, carrying out the research, interpreting the project outcomes, disseminating the findings to community groups and stakeholders. And the dissemination plan must describe plans to report findings back to the target community. You, got, you just can't do it and get it published in a journal. You've got to report something back to the community in a language and a manner that is most beneficial to the community you're working with. And I'm just going to go through a few no-nos, and again, these are kind of my opinions, and my, you know, other people might disagree with this, but preparing grant proposals last minute and expecting to be competitive, no, uh -huh. this happens. Uh, people come in, and, and the, on one side, the academic side will work on this, and, and won't give it to the community side until two weeks before. And, and then they'll call me, and I, I you know, either, it depends, you know, I'm, I, sometimes I recommend they not submit it or submit it elsewhere or wait for the next cycle. Sometimes they submit it but, and see how it goes. But I'm, I'm telling you, that's not something you want reviewers to see. Something that just looks like it's just really been thrown together. That's, that's yeah, that's a big no-no. Um, and the reviewers can detect it and they will give it a worse score and it, will, and, and, and it discourages people. I mean, it really does. Um, so that, that's, that's my plug for it, like working early, making sure each side has enough time to give feedback you know, have a plan, have a structure, you know, and hold each other accountable so that you're getting the, the you know, updates, revisions, things you need. And um, propose, propose, being too ambitious, proposing to do more work than could reasonably be done in the two or three years. You know, sometimes if, if you want it, the community needs it, but you got to expand it to the other grant. That's why you have the long-term relationship. You're going to carve out one part of the problem, attack, attack it as much as you can, and then you leave the carrot for reviewers to say, okay, if they do that, then the next grant would be they'll do this other issue. You can say that in the grant proposal. You know, we're gonna do what we can, and then we would like to expand this and this, that, and the other. And they like that. You, you know, we're funding you, they wanna see that there's an investment in, in funding. Um, and the proposal's written primarily by one research partner. This is another problem. Sometimes the reviewers cannot, they don't hear the community voice come through. And it's been challenging because Sometimes on the person writing the grant side, they'll say, the community side wrote this. This is, this is I took this from what they said. It means that, and it's, it's a hard, it's sometimes it's challenging to finesse, but to convince other people that, okay, this is the community voice. This, you know, how to convey that, that this is what the community sees as the problem. Maybe, um, I remember one case where uh, a community group said, well, we, you know, uh, smokeless tobacco use, chewing tobacco use, 90% of this rural community. The reviewers didn't buy it. They said, where's the data for that? But the community sees it that way. 
So there's a way to explain that the community has done a survey or, 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 or observed or collected something that shows that this is a big problem. And, and because if it looks like it's written by the academic side, they'll say, well, where's the citation? Where's the literature support? Where's this? Where's that? Um, and, and, and as a program officer, we do provide some technical assistance if people have questions of, does this sound community voice like? Is this too much, too little? But it also is a, a grantsmanship process, and it's working with you know, people who have gotten grants funded doing this work or communicating back and forth to say, is the community voice coming through effectively? And that, that, that's a challenge, that's a nuance. That, that's a, one of those things that comes with practice, I think. Okay, next one. Okay. And um, I'm going to go now and out of the no-nos and do's and go into our research priorities. So you have a little bit of background on that. We have five research priorities, but I've kind of broken them out to, um, it looks like more than five, but they're really five major priorities. Um, the, Research studies we want to see should address um, prevention and the treatment of tobacco use, promote equity among disproportionately impacted California communities. That's really the type of grants I oversee. Uh, studies on the basic neuroscience of nicotine addiction are needed and wanted. Advanced uh, research that will advance policies to reduce environmental exposure to the toxic effects of tobacco smoke, secondhand smoke, thirdhand smoke. Um, uh, yeah, like I said, tobacco smoke residue, cigarette butts. Um, and other tobacco products. Slide. Um, and another priority is to expand the scientific basis to inform regulation of nicotine and tobacco products at local, state, and national level. Uh, really, that's, that's uh, my colleague Phil Gardner oversees that side of our, our policy research portfolio. Advanced in innovative research in the early diagnosis of tobacco-related diseases. Under that, we, we also monitor um, the California Cancer Research Fund tax checkoff that uh, California income taxpayers uh, contribute, donate money toward. And right now, we're, we're focused on, for those dollars, uh, research to affect um, barriers to lung cancer, early detection, and cancer prevention among California's disproportionately impacted groups, um, those really impacted by lung cancer, um, uh, certain Asian American groups, especially Vietnamese men and African Americans in particular, but other groups disproportionately impacted as well. Um, and then another, um, the last one I think I put on here is advanced ability of communities throughout California to assess and limit the influence of the tobacco industry. All of the nefarious marketing strategies they do and uh, poor communities, communities of color, putting flavored, cheap uh, tobacco products right across the street from schools. That is the practices that have not changed to attract youth and and uh, keep the, keeping prices of tobacco products lower in lower income groups uh, to maintain nicotine addiction and, and advance use of nicotine. So now I want to give a little example of a successful um, CDPR project that uh, we just funded last year. Um, it's a new project um, that was well, about almost a year, completed its first year, um, and it's entitled uh, Practice-Based Intervention for Vietnamese and Korean patients. It's focused on tobacco cessation uh, at Asian Health Services in Oakland and Chinatown. PIs are Susan Wong and Janice So. Um, Susan Wong, Dr. Wong's at America, Asian Health Services and Janice is at UC San Francisco. Uh, study aims are to foster a strong community research collaboration to promote smoking cessation in Vietnamese and Korean immigrant communities. So here we have that building, that collabor collaboration, that, that you know, that infrastructure there. Develop a culturally uh, appropriate intervention for the community health center setting. Those are the aims of the study. That's what they propose. Short and sweet. Moving on. Um, the principles and process that I, I pulled from their grant proposal, um, they said they're going to conduct focus groups with patients and providers to identify what messages would be most influential in terms of tobacco cessation. Uh, develop a sample of the intervention that includes automated computerized surveys and delivery of short videos that include uh, physicians at Asian Health uh, Services that are providing tailored quitting advice and resources uh, based on the patient. And that will be based on what people say in the focus groups that they're doing. And they're also going to develop tools for enhancing the patient provider uh, tobacco related communication based on focus group responses as well. They're going to test this intervention with 30 uh, Vietnamese and 30 Korean patients and conduct a short survey with providers to explore how feasible and acceptable the intervention is to patients and providers. And that was a, that was a grant that was uh, very well received in, um, in the review process. 
So, you know, a fair bit of work, you know, two years, you got a number of, of people involved and participants to recruit, but to reviewers, they came across as clean and, and effective and what was needed. Am I on time? I think I've been talking a lot. I need to close it? Okay. Um, so, oh, I have two more slides. Uh, <laughs> So these are our key dates. They're going to change, so I really don't want to go too much into it, but I just wanted to put the plug that December 1st is when our call for proposals goes out. Um, we do a letter of intent process, which I can explain more. If you have questions, let me know. Um, go to the next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, February 13th, I'm going to hold a training on CBPR for tobacco control. It'll be at our offices at, uh, in Oakland, and it will really focus on um, well, probably, we usually aim for about eight to 10 groups. Uh, and so about 20 people on the academic community side. And we, and we have people do a brief proposal, they get it reviewed, get feedback right there. So Nike Fernandez, Nike Fernandez has been one of our uh, reviewers for that before. And then the last slide is my contact info and I also have business cards, but uh, these folks here know how to get in touch with me if you have any questions. Thank you.